I read this week there's a fine line between a long, drawn-out sermon and a hostage situation. So let's jump into a brief sermon today. All right, if you have your notes, I want you to pull them out. More. We've been in this series entitled More. More. It's the secret to a better life. More. Not more stuff, but more of God. More of loving God with all that we are, body, mind, soul, spirit. More of knowing and experiencing God. More awe and intimacy with our Creator, our Savior, our God. Less of this world, more of God. The psalmist declared it like this in Psalm 73. It's our signature verse. It might be worth your memorizing. Put this to note. I'm going to preach through a couple of more weeks on more of God. Next week in marriage, the following week again in marriage and sexuality. I want to talk and address some things biblically on that day. Less of this world, more of God. Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. Man, when you reach that point in your prayer life, that's a peaceful place, a deep place. It's a hard place to get to if there are things that we desire more. More of God. The headwaters of all streams of desire. I want you to listen closely. In his book, Tim Keller's book, Prayer, Experiencing the Awe and Intimacy of God. And by the way, 10 people picked that book up last week. I ordered a few more. They're on the back table today. Tim Keller quotes one of the heroes and fathers of our faith. He lived in 300, almost 400 um, AD, Augustine. He was the, one of the early fathers in Northern Africa who was speaking into Christianity. And in his journal... In his journal called The Confessions, he wrote this. He realized that all the things that he loved were only in God. They were the headwaters of the streams of desire was found only in God. But what do I love when I love you? Not the beauty of any body or the rhythm of time and its movement, not the radiance of light so dear to our eyes, not the sweet melodies in the world of manifold sounds, not the perfume of flowers or ointments and spices, not manna, not honey, not the limbs so delightful to the body's embrace. It's none of these things that I love when I love my God. And yet when I love my God, I do indeed love a light and a sound and a perfume and a food and an embrace. I love those, a light and sound and perfume and food and embrace in my inner self. There my soul is flooded with a radiance which no space can contain. There are music sounds which time never bears away. There I smell a sweet perfume which no wind disperses. There I taste a food that no surfeit embitters. There is an embrace which no uh, society ever severs. Nothing satisfies. It is this that I love when I love my God. More of God. Hey, my hope today is to point our thoughts toward what it might look like to have more of God in family. More of God in family. We know this, when family is good, it's great. When family's hard, it's heartbreaking. And I would tell you, I covet your prayers. Anytime I decide to, the Lord has led me to teach on family, it's a hard week in our family. And I learn what it looks like. I prayed more for each child in my home and more for my marriage this week than I have in probably over a year. And I'll confess, I yelled louder and longer at one member of my family more than I ever have in my entire life. And I was heartbroken. And so I'm about to preach on marriage this week, next week. And I'm going to talk about some other things. So I covet your prayers because the Lord stirs within me, man, all the aches and pains of humanity, some of that might be yours. It can possibly be mine as I long for family to be all that God wants for me and for you. And so let me start with some pastoral encouragement. As I could hear a pin drop, it has gotten really silent in this room. Let me offer this. What I share today, and it's going to be brief, there's nothing new that hasn't been part of Christ-centered families for the last 20 centuries. People have been trying to have a God-centered family. So you're not going to hear some brand new secret. 
we're going to hear some trusted and tried principles of God. Now, I do hope you hear something from God. You came today to hear something from him, not from me. God's word gives instructions for families. And he constantly says, I give you these instructions and you can do it. So be encouraged. You can do this. Don't lose heart. Now, let me uh, also say this. Throughout this morning's message, I don't want you to hear, you should do that. You should do this. Here's what I want you to hear. Hey, how can we help? How can these words encourage you? How can they lift you up? We want to help. We never want to condescend. We never want to talk down. We want to give instruction and talk up from the word of God. Now, the enemy would love to destroy your family and mine. And every family that's walked through brokenness, some experiencing that in a real way today, I would tell you this. If we gave them the microphone, they would speak today in the power and grace of Christ. And they would talk about potentially divorce or death or dysfunction and what happens in the realities they have to face day by day. And they would tell you and I, whatever it would take, whatever it would take to pour more of God in family, they would do it. And so we ought to take wisdom from folks who walk through difficult days and say, what have you learned? And they would say, don't let anything be sacrificed at the altar of your family. Not your business, not your selfish desires, not dysfunction, not your family of origin that might need to be dealt with. Don't let any of that rob from the family God has given you today. And amen, that's right. And so pour in today the wisdom from God and let God be more in you and your family. God created family first. So see how he might in, just invite you and I to treasure him and family most of all. And then hear this from your pastor. Wellspring wants to help you. Wellspring wants to pray and walk alongside. We have resources. We have Wellspring kids and student ministry that's working alongside you to be the best parent you can be at this time in your life and become a better parent. And grandparents who are right here with us, and I would say the younger audience ought to turn and look. We have some sage-wise, experienced people in this room who can speak into our lives. They've walked this journey 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and I want to listen to them and learn in my own life as well. And so here we go. Let's dive in very quickly. Here's some real, relevant, revered instruction for families. This is straight from God's Word. You're going to see a few highlights on the screen and in your notes. Take note of this. Look at Deuteronomy 6. It's the principle we use in Wellspring Kids. It's a principle that godly churches use to help develop the spiritual development of every child. These are the commands, the decrees, the laws of the Lord. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. He's made a covenant. He's brought them out of bondage. He's speaking to them in the desert. God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing. They're about to go over the Jordan to the promised land so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them. And then he gives them lots of instructions. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. In the New Testament, Paul speaks to the young church at Colossia. Hey, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Then he gives instructions. Wives, husbands, children. You can look in Colossians 3. Ephesians 3, a young church in Ephesus. Ephesians 3, submit to one another out of reference for Christ. Submit out of your reverence for Christ. I love what Tony Dungy, Super Bowl award-winning coach, he says, look, the scripture here is not about how much the wife has to submit to the husband. It's more about how every believer surrenders and says, God, I want what you want. And so then speak to me. And out of that becomes a wonderful, gentle, servant-leading husband that anyone would love to partner with in their life. Ephesians 6 goes on to say this, children, listen up, children, obey your parents. Look at this, it's right. Honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with a promise. You're going to live long. It's 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. 
Love always protects. Love always trusts, hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 22, Proverbs 32, Joshua 24, the Psalms, they're full of instructions. I could go on and on and on. God created family first, and it's obvious. Not only does he want to instruct, he wants to bless. How many of you want God to bless your family today? How many? Every single one of us. And God wants to bless you, especially with more of him. Hey, if you want to turn to Genesis 24, I'm going to read one verse, Genesis 24. I want you to listen to this principle in Scripture. Now, Abraham was old, Genesis 24, 1. You can write it to the side, pull out your electronic Bible, your physical Bible. Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Now, Abraham was old, and he was well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. In all things. I was reading some commentaries this week by a great theologian. He's probably the foremost uh, leader in the Middle East now as far as understanding everything that's happening with Muslims and Christians and history and ancient land boundaries and all that sort of things. Jim Dennison speaks to this particular passage of Scripture. Notice what he says. God recognizes there's no sacred and secular division. There's no distinction between religion and the real world. All things... That's where we all live. That's where we live in all things. And God blessed Abraham in all things. So like any good father who wants the best for his children, God loves us. He loves you and I. So let me remind you of this. You don't have to fight for God's attention. He knows you. He sees you. You don't have to earn any more of his love. And so many of us, because that's what we had to do in our family of origin, still think we've got to earn more of God's love. Man, rest in the fact that he loves you immensely. And he wants to bless you in all things. Jesus clearly says this. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. So I want to address this question. Does God going to bless me in all things mean that I can keep sinning and he's going to bless me? Does it mean that no harm or no hardship's ever going to come my way? So listen clearly. Listen clearly. Jesus, in John 16, In the world, you'll have tribulation. See, God's love and blessing doesn't give us a pass from living in a fallen world where disease and dysfunction and disaster threaten us every day. Nor does it exempt us from the freedom of poor choices that we make or others make. So they lead to pain, and often we suffer because of our sin or we suffer because of the sins of others. Isn't that a reality? Wow. But our Father's desire is to bless us in all things. All things. So let's look further at what Jesus promised. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And one of the last things he said before he went back home to heaven, he said, look, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the presence of God is one of the blessings we need to capture in our hearts and our minds. He is with us in all things. He's walking with us. If there's hardship, he's walking with us with his grace amidst sometimes our own poor choices or sin. He's walking with us and he's not going to forsake us. He's not going to stop loving us when other things have happened and we're simply the victim, including death and dysfunction and disease. I'm shocked. Over the last year, we've had people shooting people all over our country. Gosh, we've had 30, 40 people die of the flu this year. And you go, God, did you cause all that? Because of the brokenness of sin in our world, death, disease, and dysfunction happen. But Jesus says this, take heart. I've overcome the world and I'm with you. And I would tell you, I've sat at the bedside of people who have died and they said, I am so ready to leave this world. There's nothing I desire in this world more. I'm ready to go be with the Savior. When you get to that place in life, you realize I can deal with whatever mess is happening here because I long to be with my Savior, my Creator, my God, the one I sing to, the one I raise my hands to. Man, there's no other name than Jesus. When you get to that place, then all of a sudden you've got a perspective to deal with the days that we still remain on this earth. And the blessing is that God is with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Do you want the blessing of God? Absolutely. I know you do. 
And so how do we see that in our families? How do we see the blessing of God present moment by moment? I'm going to outline a couple of things for you today. Let's see if we can apply faith in our family. Number one, let's talk about family devotion. Family devotion. One is an intent, the other is an action. In Joshua 24, the great hero of our faith, a great warrior, they pass over into the Jordan. He's speaking among potentially a couple hundred thousand, maybe two million people. Scholars aren't exactly sure how many people were left. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors who served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in his land that you're now living. But as for me and my house, he's about to declare his intent. As for me... And my house, don't anybody confuse this. Here's where Joshua is about to stand. We will serve the Lord. So the first is, have you declared with intent of your heart, mind, and soul, man, this household's going to serve the Lord. Man, we are a people of faith. We will serve the Lord. And if you have, let me offer some actions you might want to take. Because your actions should follow your intent. When's the last time? And just ask yourself, this is not condemning. This is kind of self-assessment. Hey, when's the last time our home prayed? When's the last time we've read? When's the last time we've sung together as a family? Any of that happening in our home? How about family devotion? Maybe at a mealtime or at bedtime. Have we talked about God? Maybe when we left church or we had lunch or we talked about the message or we talked about camp or D-Now or our mom went to the women's meeting or dad came home from coffee with a group of guys. When's the last time those conversations? Well, I want to encourage you, start having those. If your intent is we will serve the Lord, then man, hop in and let your actions follow. There's a real simple little book. Some people read it this week in entirety. It'll take you about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. It's called Family Devotion. There's probably 10 or 12 of them. They're $5. If you want, pick one up. It's a great little primer to say, how do we do that? How do we do that? How do I, how do I get started? And I would tell you this as your pastor, getting started is the hardest part. Getting started. And so I'm going to coach us a little bit. Men, fathers, husbands, you may fall into that category. Let me guide you. And I would just tell you this. I can biblically stand here and, man, I'd love to have this at a, like a barbershop moment and just say, man, as the father goes, so goes the family. And man, I'd just take off the gloves and I'd say, man, I want to help you. But I would tell you, if you set your intent on let's have this family serve the Lord, your family will follow. I believe that. And so let me just encourage you, men, as you go, so goes your family. God has wired your wife to say, man, I want to follow God the husband. Children, even when you're imperfect, when you're imperfect, and all of us are, they want, oh, my dad has a longing for God. They'll follow. They really will. And so let me encourage us. Dad, your role is to be the initiator. That's what spiritual leadership looks like. You do not have to be Greg Laurie or Billy Graham. You don't have to be Pastor Chris, but you initiate, you get started. And I love what the author, Donald Whitney, has in that little book back there. On page 60, he says this, and I love this. This is so genuine. This is so honest. What if you as a husband or dad came and said, I have come to believe that the Bible teaches I should be leading. I can lead us in family worship. And I want to start. Oh, I got a lot to learn about it. But I want to do what I believe God wants me to do. Will you join me? What if every man in the room said that type of words? I think there's wives longing to say, I'll hop right in with you. Let's do this together. I think there's children that would say, oh, and children, let me encourage you. Man, instead of nagging and complaining, com and complaining and moaning and everything, say, okay, maybe we've never done this before, but we can. Okay, let's see if we can pray together. I mean, the hard part's just getting started where most people are like, man, we've never done this before. Somebody else always prayed at the Thanksgiving meal, but maybe you get started. That's the hope of today's message is how do you get started with family worship? If you're single, listen up. You are already a family. You're completely whole. You're not a subset. You're not second class. You're completely whole in God. 
Scripture's clear in that. Your value in Christ is in that. But let me encourage you, many of you interact with other families, and so let me encourage you to be intentional. And when there are times where you're at family meals or family gatherings or defining moments, hop in when they pray, hop in when they worship, hop in when they sing. And let me encourage all of us, man, hop in as a family of God. I heard last week and the last couple weeks people have been signing up for family groups. Men have been coming to men's time, women have been coming to women's ministry, and I'm hearing, oh my gosh, I treasure this so much. These people pray with me. They do life together. I'm so encouraged. We love each other. Man, be part of the family of God as you're learning in your personal family to have more of God in you. Hey, how about more of God and family can also include family play. Family play. Let me give you three words here. Sabbath, Saturday, and schedule. Sabbath. You play better when you have a foundation of rest. We all do. Saturdays used to be an old commercial. AMF Voigt was the number one ball maker years ago. Hey, we were made for weekends was their slogan. So on your weekend, most of us have most of the day off Saturday. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. What about your schedule? Let me encourage you to be intentional about your schedule regarding family. Hey, I live there, I've done that. I've remodeled five homes, I've gutted houses and every waking minute was painting and pulling stuff and carpet and redoing the landscape. And next thing you know, I'm exhausted. I've never even spoken to my wife or my kids. I've been guilty of all that. Hey, we've been guilty of 14 ball games on a particular day at three different sites, and the next thing you know, I forgot what my kids' names were, and there's two other kids sleeping in the middle of the night with them because they're going to the game the next day. I mean, I've done all those things, right? But there's a part of this family play that's so valuable. When you go to the movie together, or you sit down and you laugh together, or you eat together, and so let me encourage you, make an investment to ask some God questions when you're doing those things in life and pray and laugh together and tell stories together. God wants to bless in all things. Why not include that in your home? For some of you, it's as simple as get out the board games, get out the cards, get out the dominoes, do something fun. One of our family favorites, we get to borrow it when our sweet Taylor gets to come over. She's about to marry our second son. We do that video game called Just Dance. It's on TV. The pastor declared it. I do the dance thing. I'm horrible. I never win. All my kids do. You take your phone, you get to dance with something on the screen, and we laugh and play, and man, it is a hoot. There's so many things available for you to play together. Families that play together stay together. So let me encourage you to play together as a family. Here's the last thing I want to say today. Let me give you a word of caution. There's some family killers for our families today. You could come up with the list. I'm going to re, you know, give you a couple of them here. Abuse, dysfunction, addiction, poor nutrition, pornography, brokenness, lack of communication, materialism, poverty, laziness. I could keep the list going. And all of us cringe because these may hit a few of us. Let me offer some that are real killers, and I want to encourage families to consider what would more of God mean regarding decisions on these items. Number one, our media. The use of media in our home. It's potentially a great resource. It's also possibly the greatest danger that's shooting holes in your family. And I would just tell you this. You wouldn't dare let somebody come in with a gun and take over your family and maim your children and your wife and tear up your home. And yet the media can do all of those things if you're not cautious. So put on guard the use of media with every member of your home. We want to help you with that. And so ask some questions. We, we want to, to guide. Hey, second, busyness. Busyness. If God can't get us distracted, derailed, or living in sin, then he'll get us overbooked and fatigued. Amen? I'm stepping on my own toes now. You can go to my Facebook page and see everything about my life. Actually, it's my wife's Facebook page. I go to it to find out more about my own life. <laughs> Where am I supposed to be at the end of the day? Oh, she told me. Okay, here we go. We got a lot of people in our house, so it's pretty easy to get busy. You may only have one or two, but it's pretty easy to get busy. It can be a killer to your family. Be careful with that. Here's another one. Too many choices. Too many high, complex decisions. It's funny. I uh, listened to a missionary family came in from overseas, and they said they were shocked when they went to the grocery store simply to buy salad dressing. 
When they left, the salad dressing choices were French, Italian, Thousand Islands. A little vinegar and oil, and then all of a sudden ranch came along. Now they come back, and there's over 200 salad dressing choices. They said, man, it was shocking when we went down the cereal aisle. Oh, my gosh. So let me just offer this. Do you need to limit some choices for your family in order to get more of God? Sometimes children are paralyzed because there's just too many things going on and we need to simplify life. Here's the last thing, lack of spiritual intention. It's really at the heart. I'm going to read a quote and wrap up this morning. Nancy Lee DeMoss uh, says this. She's the author of uh, about 15 books. Many of our women might recognize she does a radio program, and it's called uh, The Quiet Place and some other things that she does. She's an amazing speaker, author. I love her material. She says this, and it really makes you wrestle and make you think. And so I want to make sure none of us miss this, that are parents in the room especially. One of the greatest heartaches of uh, my adult life, she says, has been to watch so many young adults who grow up in our Christian homes and churches, who demonstrate so little spiritual interest in spiritual matters. Or worse yet, they claim to be Christians while living in ways clearly contrary to the Word of God. We have to ask ourselves, what's causing this lack of passion to follow hard after Christ? So then she asks herself this, what's happening or what's not happening. She goes on to unpack this. Clearly, parents, we can't make every decision for our children. We can't do that. We know that when they leave our home after 18 or 20 years, they're on their own for the most part. We have a few years to build a foundation. But we are responsible to sow good seed, especially as our children are young and their fertile hearts open to wisdom, training, instruction of the Lord. And so is God's first discipleship happening in our home with our children, she goes on to ask and say. And so I would just encourage us, if the crop of next generation fails because of lack of seed sown or lack of watering and nurturing, who's to blame with that? That's you and me as a parent. And so I just would encourage us to spend every effort to raise disciplined, productive, godly, mature children and not let them be described otherwise when they become adults. Now, unless we're caught off guard, my children and yours, God-fearing families that are sitting here today, our children have a target on their back. I tell our young people it's the hardest time to ever grow up to be a young person. Those of you who teach in our schools know this. It is hard to be a young person. The enemy wants to destroy our children and wants to destroy your family and mine. And damn him for that. I'm angry at the devil for trying to pick off my children and yours. He can go to hell. I'm passionate about that. And I will spend the rest of my life helping you and me raise our children for the next generation to see godly moms, dads, husbands, fathers raising the next generation. I want more of God in my family. Amen. So I urge us all, man, set the intent in your heart. As for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, let's pray. Heavenly Father, the psalmist would declare, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. God, I pray for everyone in this room today as they desire to grow in faith that their daily journey, they set their heart's desire to Jesus. Let him be the destination of their faith. Not more stuff, but more of him. Help us not to get derailed, but to set our minds clearly on you. Lord, as I'm praying for families, uh, let me just encourage you. If you'd say, man, I know that I want to lead in my home and I don't know how and I need help and gosh, I want this for our family. Would you just pray that silently to the Lord? I don't need to see your hand. I don't need to, to see your eyes. I want the Lord just to hear your prayer silently. Just say, oh God, help us to have more of you. And so, Lord, in the name of the Jesus, the powerful name, protect every marriage in this room, protect every family in this room, protect every child that's growing up. 
man, may the victory that comes from the presence, the blessing that comes that you are with us and we can take heart because you have overcome everything that happens in this world. Oh God, help us to live in that power and peace today. I pray for families that you'd bless immensely. In Jesus' name, amen.